Hi, and welcome once again. My name is Alexander Haberbush, and I'm president of the Lex Rex Institute and a constitutional attorney. And this video today is going to be our second in our new series, which we're calling Ask an Attorney. Now, you may remember in our first entry in this series, I mentioned that these were going to be posted on Friday afternoons, and that is still true. Uh, however, the reason that I'm posting on a Monday today is that our content uh, was actually flagged on YouTube and removed for allegedly spreading misinformation about the 2020 election, and we were subject to a one-week ban from posting videos. Uh, that ban just expired uh, on Saturday, so that's why I'm posting today instead of Friday. And I'm not going to get into any of the details about what happened with that uh, that election law content, uh, except to say that all of that content is still available through our website. We've reposted those videos on other websites. You can go to our website, lexrex.org, uh, click on our articles that are about, um, about those takedown notices, and then you can still view the videos there as well as read about what happened. Uh, but we are probably going to be pursuing action against YouTube for this. So if that's something that you feel moved to contribute to, I know despite the fact that we're on YouTube right now, I think a lot of YouTube patrons uh, feel like we do and aren't too happy about the things YouTube is doing. So if you do feel moved about putting a stop to that, uh, please consider contributing on our website. Again, lexrex.org. Uh, but none of that is the subject of today's video. Today is, as I mentioned, part two in our Ask an Attorney series, uh, the series where I answer your questions, questions from the community about constitutional law or really any law subjects in general. Anything you have a question about that has to do with the law, go ahead and ask that. You can ask in, in the comment section on this video or any of our other Ask an Attorney videos. You can ask on our Facebook page for the Lex Rex Institute, uh, or you can go to our website and email it to us, which is actually what today's uh, questioner did. Um, so to get to today's question, Today's question is from an anonymous asker, and they have asked, uh, why are some states referred to as constitutional carry states? Aren't all states supposed to be able to exercise the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights? Well, that's an interesting question, and I'm actually going to deal with the second part of this question first, about uh, whether the Bill of Rights applies to the states or, or who's protected by the Bill of Rights. Um, I think that's the simpler of the two to answer, and then I'll come back and answer the question specifically about the Second Amendment. Well, so the Bill of Rights um, is, as you guys probably know, it's the first ten amendments to our Constitution. They were ratified in uh, 17, uh, after the Constitution in 1787, they were ratified by the First Continental Congress subsequent to that. Uh, and it includes the first ten amendments, which pertain to the rights of the people. I think a more apt name, though, of the Bill of Rights would have been a Bill of Limitations on Government. Because the Bill of Rights is not meant to be an exhaustive list of rights, and more importantly, and which I'll get to in a bit, it's not meant to create new rights. Uh, instead, it's meant to limit federal government. And those limitations ap uh, apply, or the rights protected by those limitations, apply to different groups. And you can actually see those different groups recognized uh, in the original text of those amendments. Uh, take, for instance, the First Amendment. Uh, which says, Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion, um, or something to that effect. I may be not quoting it exactly, but it's essentially, Congress shall pass no law. Uh, clearly, based on what from what that says, it applies to Congress. It says, Congress shall pass no law respecting the establishment of religion. Um, that has, says nothing about the states passing that law. Now, who exercises the freedom of religion? Um, who is being protected against an established church? Well, that right would obviously apply to the people. States don't exercise a religion. People exercise religion. Uh, Second Amendment applies to different groups. Uh, Second Amendment, you know, it, it says uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So that one seems to protect maybe two groups. Certainly it protects the people because it says the right of the people shall not be infringed. So clearly there is a personal, individual right there. Uh, but then it also says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So uh, clearly there are rights of a state that may be implicated there as well. Now this question is complicated or, or maybe simplified, depending how you look at it, somewhat by the 14th Amendment. Uh, 14th Amendment was passed just after the Civil War. It's one of the Civil War amendments, uh, also included in those are several other amendments, um, but significantly what the 13th, or I'm sorry, what the 14th Amendment does, uh, as applied by the court, 
uh, is creates what is called uh, selective incorporation doctrine. And what selective incorporation doctrine does is it allows the court to incorporate restrictions that previously only applied to the federal government and make them apply to the states as well. So where the First Amendment says Congress shall pass no law respecting the establishment of religion, now the court interpret that, interprets that to mean that the states can't pass laws establishing a religion either. So they're can't be a Church of California and there can't be a Church of the United States. You can't have an official church propped up by taxpayer money that people are compelled to be members of. Of the 14th Amendment. Uh, that was done under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Many scholars, including myself, think that if they were going to go that route, it really would have been better to do it under the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. But that's a subject for a different video, and if you guys are interested, you can ask about that. Uh, but anyway, I think that answers the second part of the question about uh, whether or not the Bill of Rights um, protects the rights of the states to keep and bear arms. That, that's not a state thing. Uh, that actually protects, and actually, you know, th there's actually a Supreme Court case on this uh, from as recently as 2010 uh, called McDonald v. City of Chicago, in which the Supreme Court ruled explicitly that selective incorporation doctrine did indeed incorporate the Second Amendment so that it applied against state governments as well. So neither the states nor the federal government can uh, violate the right to bear arms, to keep and bear arms. Now, what that right consists of is a different question, and I think that's probably where the substance of the question that was asked today is getting. Uh, let me show that question one more time. Okay, so why are some states referred to as constitutional carry states? Sort of, I think it's sort of a, a you know, a long drink for a long walk for a small drink of water. Um, but uh, to get to that question about constitutional carry states, well. Constitutional carry is sort of a marketing term that certain states have used, particularly in light of the Heller decision. Uh, that's the decision in the court case, uh, District of Columbia v. Heller. Uh, and uh, it's a marketing term just to reflect what those states understand to be the constitutional understanding of the Second Amendment. So to understand that, we have to look at what happened in U.S. v. Heller. Um, before we look at that case, what you should be aware of, there's not a lot of jurisprudence pertaining to the Second Amendment. Um, what I mean by that is the Supreme Court has not heard cases about the Second Amendment very often in the 240-odd year history of the United States. Uh, it's just not something that the court has examined in any great detail. Uh, but th the case that is now controlling law on this subject is the Heller decision. Uh, that case was, was heard and decided in 2008. Uh, ju the late Justice Scalia wrote the opinion in that case. Uh, and what that case uh, asked about was uh, there was currently on the books in the in Washington DC in the District of Columbia there was a law that said that all private ownership of uh, handguns was prohibited only law enforcement were allowed to own handguns this law had been in effect since I believe 1975 uh, and it was just challenged in uh, 2008 and I, I believe the person that brought the suit was a fellow at the Cato Institute who, who was bringing it sort of for um, uh, to, to advance the, the aims of that organization uh, and it was uh, brought on behalf of a number of different plaintiffs, of which Heller ended up being the named plaintiff. So it's several cases that were brought by a bunch of different people were all joined together into one case, all of which challenged this uh, District of Columbia law saying that individuals could not own handguns. Uh, and they challenged this on Second Amendment grounds, saying that because the Second Amendment protects the right of the people to keep and bear arms, this District of Columbia law was unconstitutional. And the court does end up finding in their favor, recognizing really for the first time in the Supreme Court's history that the First Amendment does indeed apply to individuals. Uh, the, you know, I think it's a fairly obvious conclusion given that the, uh, the text of the, the Second Amendment directly says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, and as we know, I think it's it's advisable to for courts, certainly advisable for courts, but I think it's advisable for our interests to go over some of the canons of interpretation. Uh, the first thing you look at when interpreting any law, sta whether statutory or constitutional, is the text of that statute. And if the text of that statute is unambiguous, then you go with what that statute says. 
Uh, you know, you could talk all you want about the spirit of a law, but as Justice Marshall put very, very well, real early on in our republic in 1819, that although the spirit of a law is instrumental, especially of a constitution, it is to be respected not less than its letter, yet the spirit is to be collected chiefly from its words. Uh, in other words, you know what the spirit of a law is by looking at the words of that law. Uh, and I think that's what they did with the Second Amendment, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so what did the opposing argument look like? Well, that argument said that the right to keep and bear arms applied only to the state militias. I don't think that argument holds a lot of water, both for the textual reasons that I mentioned, as well as for some historical reasons, and Scalia's opinion actually gets into both of these things. Uh, there's a fairly lengthy uh, explanation in Scalia's opinion talking just about the grammar of the Second Amendment, talking about how to parse the different words in it and showing that you know, the first clause informs the second clause. It may give a reason, the state militias may be a reason why the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but the right pertains to the people. Um, and then the second part of the opinion goes into sort of the history about uh, what the Second Amendment would have meant to those people who were alive and reading the Constitution at the time that it was ratified. Now, interestingly, uh, many times arguments on constitutional subjects will divide along lines of uh, originalists on one hand, sort of the, you know, the, the, the far end of one on one side, then the very far end of the other side is the idea of a living constitution. And the disagreements will often cleave along those lines. But there are also disagreements about what the original meaning could mean. And that is the approach the dissent ends up taking in the Heller decision. They agree that we should interpret the Second Amendment the way that it would have been interpreted when it was written, but they disagree on what it would have been interpreted to mean by people who were reading it at the time. Uh, and that's where the disagreement ends up focusing. Now, people like to do this a lot. They like to say, you know, reasonable minds can look at a text and they can differ as to what it means. Uh, and that's sort of what the dissent does in this case. They differ as to what that text meant. Now, I, I don't think that holds a lot of water. And the reason why I don't, you know, I have a few reasons why I don't think that holds a lot of water. Uh, first of all, works. Uh, the Bill of Rights does not create new rights. The Bill of Rights recognizes pre-existing rights. It's probably the greatest misconception about the Bill of Rights, honestly, uh, is the idea that uh, they were creating new rights that had not previously been recognized. So to understand what I mean here, we've got to look at the history of the American colonists prior to independence with Britain. Um, you know, it, it's popularly talked about in the War of Independence that uh, the, the rights that the colonists were fighting for were uh, rights that did not exist for British subjects. That's not true. What all the colonists were ever fighting for, and if you'd, if you'd gone up to any member of the First Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress, and you'd asked them, you know, what rights are you trying to get respected? They would say rights that we have as British subjects. Uh, we have a right against taxation without representation as British subjects. Britain has a parliament. That parliament represents people who live in Great Britain. We don't get to appoint anybody to that parliament. We are not represented in it. Therefore, that parliament cannot pass taxes that bind us. That was the argument. Uh, similarly, when they argued against quartering of troops in private homes and when they argued for the restriction of the private right to keep and bear arms, they were arguing for that right as British subjects. Significantly in the British Constitution, uh, specifically in the British Bill of Rights, uh, which was passed after the Glorious Revolution, that was when William and Mary were installed on the throne of England. Uh, it's one of the central documents of the, in the English Constitution, but the British Bill of Rights actually has a right to keep and bear arms listed in it. Now, that right only protected the right of Protestants to keep and bear arms, uh, but as we know, the United States was founded in many ways to promote religious freedom, Different states, when the Constitution was ratified, certainly had different religious persuasions. Uh, you know, Massachusetts tended to be very Puritan. Um, uh, Maryland tended to be Roman Catholic. And then you know, states like Rhode Island let anything go. So we figured as, as a purpose, as for our purposes as a federal union, we ought to make sure that we have freedom of religion so these states can continue to exercise uh, religious liberty in the way that they see fit. Uh, so, you know, it makes a lot of sense. We'd keep a very similar right to what was in the English Constitution, but we wouldn't restrict it to Protestants. Um, also significantly, if the Bill of Rights then is not creating a, well, you know, to get back to the, the uh, 
I, before I move on to that, I should, I should stick with the uh, American War of Independence for a little while. But significantly, when Americans first, early Americans, American colonists challenged these things that the British government was doing, specifically most of the objections had to do with things Parliament was doing, things like the Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts and the Intolerable Acts, all acts of Parliament, not things the King had done, uh, their complaint was that they were not being given their proper rights as British subjects. And as British subjects, they actually started out by suing in the courts for a right of redress to these rights. Uh, eventually, through those acts of parliament that I just mentioned, most of those causes of action were shifted over to what is effectively a military court or the admiralty court uh, for them to hear what should have been civil claims. Uh, that's an egregious violation of their, of their rights as British subjects. That, that, that's equivalent to, you know, if you had to go through a military court in order to challenge the constitutionality of a statute, that would just be outrageous. And rightly, they found that outrageous. Uh, and it was actually when, when the uh, Crown eventually abolished the civil courts altogether because these colonists were just getting way too unruly, uh, they created a lot of lawyers with a lot of free time on their hands because they know they couldn't go to court anymore. They couldn't argue their cases. So they all formed the first Continental Congress, which was originally formed, you know, predominantly lawyers, to get together uh, from all the different colonies and essentially petition the British Crown and the British Parliament for redress for their grievances. They, did, they never considered parting from the, the English government until they were absolutely pushed to do it. And even, if, even there, if you look at there's a reason why our Declaration of Independence isn't called a resolution for independence or isn't some kind of decision, you know, a bill saying that we're now independent. Rather, it's a declaration of independence. Well, what does that suggest? Uh, what it suggests is that it is declaring something that is already true. So what's that thing that was already true? Well, what, the, uh, what our founding fathers asserted in the Second, Con Con I'm sorry, Second Continental Congress in the Declaration of Independence was that the king, by denying them their rights as British subjects, had declared them to be outside of his protection. And then they list as causes of action so the, the various ways in which he's done that. But they're saying that the king, by placing his subjects outside of his protection, had already made them a free and independent people. And that's the basis with which they, they declare independence then. So even though Parliament had done most of the things they object to, their view was that they only owed fealty to the king because the loyalty a subject owes to a king is because the king protects his people. Therefore, if the king isn't protecting us, we declare independence from him. Parliament, a representative body, uh, is one that we never owed any kind of allegiance to, so we only have to declare de independence from the king, and that's what they did. Uh, what's the significance of this for the Second Amendment issue? The significance is that after we declare independence, we install a new form of government. This new form of government is called the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and that basically creates sort of, sort of an ad hoc system to govern the relationship between the various and several 13 states as they now exist. Uh, that structure is found to have various inadequacies, which we can get into in a different video if you guys are interested. Um, but uh, what they end up settling on instead is a federal constitution, which gives quite a bit more uh, structure and form and really power to the central government. And that that frightens some people. These people end up being called the anti-federalists and they push for a Bill of Rights to be inserted into the Constitution. Now, what's the significance of this Bill of Rights? Well, it protects the very things that are those rights that were asserted originally against King George and against Parliament and continue to be rights that they thought were um, rights that uh, were held by American citizens. So. The Bill of Rights ends up respecting those pre-existing rights which we as citizens had. So I, I think that the, the argument that, the, that uh, it only applies to state militias really breaks down because there was no right to a state militia prior to independence. We know in f for a fact there was a right to keep and bear arms recognized under the English Constitution. Um, if it's not creating a new right and we know it isn't, then it has to be a right that devolves upon the people. It can't be one that devolves upon the states. Um, that's sort of a structural argument. That's a very brief overview of that argument, but I, I think that's probably the most compelling, at least in my view. It's also, I really want you to keep that in mind because it's probably the single greatest misunderstanding of our Bill of Rights. It did not create new rights. It recognized pre-existing ones. Um, it, it significantly, you, you want more evidence on that. You can look at the fact that uh, 
when, when the uh, federal constitution went to the states for ratification, they each held uh, state ratifying conventions to, to hear the constitution. And in many of those states, they proposed alternate wordings of a lot of the amendments that ended up going into the Bill of Rights. Well, in nearly every case in which a right to bear arms was proposed, it's very clearly specified as an individual right. Uh, so I really don't think the historical argument holds much weight at all there, or holds much water at all there. Um, all that to say, Heller ends up making, in my view, the correct decision that the right to keep and bear arms devolves upon individuals. What Heller does not address then uh, is what kinds of restrictions a state can place on the right to keep and bear arms. So we know because the, the law in DC said you can't have any handguns. No private individual can have any handguns. We know that's illegal. So we know outright stripping people of any and all right to keep and bear arms is illegal. That's unconstitutional. You can't do that. Um, what we don't know about is other restrictions, lesser restrictions placed on a right to keep and bear arms. And that really has not been heard uh, since the Heller decision in 2008. Um, so a lot of those challenges remain up for question. And those are challenges that could absolutely be brought against various state laws if the court were, you know, if the Supreme Court wanted, were to take those cases on them. Um, but uh, what, so what then uh, constitutional carry states are asserting is that the requirement that a person have some kind of permit in order to be able to exercise their right to keep and bear arms is unconstitutional. That is not a position that has been recognized yet by the court, but the court hasn't said the opposite either. Now, why didn't the court just answer that question in Heller? Well, that's actually because of an important component of what we call judicial restraint. Uh, and what that component of judicial restraint says is that a judge should limit his ruling to the matters that are currently before him. Uh, he shouldn't rule on things that are not questions before the court. Uh, so the question that was before the court in the Heller case was only a law that totally took away people's right to own handguns. It didn't have uh, any kind of permitting requirement. In fact, you couldn't get a permit in Washington, D.C. So it would have been outside the purview of the decision for the court to look at whether or not permits are something that's constitutional to require. Uh, to, to illustrate this idea that courts should only rule on what's before them, uh, take, for example, you know, let's say that one of Arthur's knights, uh, the estate for one of Arthur's knights, sues Tim for, uh, for wrongful death, for failure to adequately warn about how dangerous the uh, bunny rabbit uh, that sat outside uh, of the, ca the cave was. Um, and because of this, the bunny rabbit, you know, grabbed the guy's jugular and he bled to death. Uh, and his estate is now suing Tim. And let's say the lower court found that Tim was liable for negligence. Uh, and a, su a substantial part of their opinion hinged on their finding that rabbits are a wild animal. Let's say that the, the laws for whether or not someone's liable for, some, for an animal have to do with whether or not that animal is domesticated or wild. Uh, and the court found that a rabbit is a wild animal and then accordingly that Tim is liable for wrongful death of Arthur's Knight. Uh, if the Supreme Court or if a higher court were to review that decision and they were reviewing that specific finding that a rabbit is a wild animal, they're not going to look at whether or not a snake is a wild animal or whether or not a goat is a wild animal or whether or not lizards are a wild animal or whether or not newts are a wild animal or anything else. They're going to look at whether or not a rabbit is a wild animal and they'll apply past case law uh, as well as their independent judicial reasoning uh, perhaps uh, to determine whether or not a rabbit is a wild animal. Uh, so all that to say, you know, courts restrict their ruling to the matters before them. That's a good thing. We want them doing that. We're not in favor of judicial activism, even when it serves uh, what we may view as a constitutional goal. You know, we want to have judges exercising restraint in what they do. That's what leads to our, our republic being a long-lived republic. Uh, it promotes stability. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why you want that. But all that to say, District of Columbia did not rule on those other things. So when a state asserts the right of constitutional carry, they are asserting their position on whether or not states can lawfully impose permit requirements, and they're saying that they cannot. Uh, as always, Lex Rex Institute is in favor of promoting all constitutional liberties, including Second Amendment rights. And we believe that Second Amendment rights do devolve upon every single individual. And we don't believe that it's ever constitutionally appropriate to restrict something the Constitution recognizes as a right. Um, I think I'm sure people will hear that and they'll go to some pretty outrageous conclusions with it. Like, do you think it's fine to shout fire in a crowded theater? No, I don't. 
But I don't think that's a free speech issue. I think that's an issue, firstly, of contract rights between uh, the theater goer and the person selling the ticket, the theater owner, uh, that they're going to get a show that's undisturbed by people shouting fire. Um, and it's similarly, the contract agreement between whoever shouted fire and the theater owner, I think there's an implicit understanding in that contract that they're not going to be disturbing the rights of other theater goers. Similarly, uh, I think you could easily apply negligence law to this. Um, if you shout fire in a crowded theater, it is certainly foreseeable that in the panic, people are going to get pushed aside, trampled, and bodily harm, bodily injury is going to result uh, to other people in the theater. And it's in no way restricting your freedom of speech to say that that harm is something that the other person can pursue legal remedy for. Um, yeah, again, that's not saying you don't have a freedom to say whatever you want. It's saying that you have an obligation to be responsible for the things that you do say. And I would apply that to other constitutional rights as well. Specifically, I would apply it to the Second Amendment. Uh, you know, if, if a state wants to impose a law saying that you have to make sure that uh, the firearms that you own are well protected, such that they don't harm people. Uh, you know, if somebody leaves their, their gun lying out on a table at a Starbucks or something, and then a criminal steals that gun and they use it to commit violent gun crime, I think it'd be totally appropriate for a state to create a law saying that the person that left that gun and unattended can be held liable for their negligent conduct. Uh, that was a negligent thing to do. That's not a restriction of his right to bear arms. That's just a law of general applicability that we are applying to firearms. Same, very similar to in that, uh, that crowded theater example. So yeah, hopefully all of that answers your question about, uh, whoever anonymously asked that, answers your question about constitutional carry laws. Uh, Lexrax Institute is actually considering several cases pertaining to the Second Amendment. Uh, most notably, we have several veterans who you know, vet veterans who previously owned firearms and were without any kind of administrative procedure, any kind of due process at all, no hearing of any kind, a doctor, a physician, uh, or even a psychiatrist has decided that person's mentally unfit to own weapons and they have taken away their firearms as a result. I believe that's an egregious deprivation of somebody's Second Amendment rights. Uh, we want to do everything we can to help those folks. As you imagine, these are not people with real deep pockets. Uh, these are retired veterans, people who have devoted their life to our country. Um, and we want to do everything we can to help them. We need contributions to do that. So if, if you want to donate to help one of those veterans who's, been, who's had their firearms unjustly taken away from them, please donate at our website. Uh, we do allow people to, to state preference on their donations so we know where you want that money to be spent, and we really do respect that. If we see that you want money to be allocated to a certain thing, uh, we see that, you know, that that's, we, we view ourselves as custodians of the money that we receive, so we'll try to make sure that it does go to that cause. Um, I think that sort of concludes my thoughts on uh, at least these aspects of the Second Amendment. Um, yeah, so, you know, as, as always, this is a presentation of the Lex Rex Institute. Nothing that I have said in this video should be construed to constitute legal advice. If you do want my legal advice, we offer free consultations. Uh, you can sign up for one of those on our website. Uh, for now, I think that concludes what I have to say. So I, I'll see everybody, well, not next week, see everybody on Friday, since we'll have another one of these videos up on Friday. And as always, please ask your questions. You may see your question answered in next week's video. All right, goodbye, everybody.